I, I was talking with Faye just a day or so before we left. I was, she was doing something about the Ten Commandments. I said, there's the problem. It's one commandment short. It should be the first commandment is have mercy. Have mercy in the straight old New Testament way. Feel out with your heart. When, when you see somebody hurting, reach out and comfort them. It, you know, it doesn't make any difference whether they're on the good side or the bad side. The more TV we watch, the more people we see, see get killed, the more guns that go off, the less mercy we're going to have, and the smaller this number of people are going to be. And we're going to continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller until finally the evil force will just crush us under its foot, it, or it wishes. The thing is, I think we're going to win. And I think is that this is why they're so scared of marijuana right now, is because not that it's going to kill teenagers, not that it's a gateway drug. I don't even know whether there, there is such a thing. It's, you know, it's like saying marijuana leads to heroin. You can say the same thing about milk and whiskey. Uh, everything leads to everything. But I've known people for a long time, watched them do drugs for a long time. There's nobody ever died of marijuana. And how many people have died? 500,000 people uh, died of... Uh, cigarette smoking, and yet we are standing there letting them do it because some pork belly guy from our state wants these guys without shoes up on the ridges to raise his stuff and sell down there. It's, it's jobs. Uh, that's what they're saying about all the uh, penitentiaries. It makes for jobs. Uh, but pretty soon, there's going to be so many of them, and they're turning out these, they're turning loose these guys up in Oregon who, who are there for violent crimes. They're turning them loose because the federal uh, law says you've got to stick these guys in there for 25 years. And, and what is going to come out, even if they only do 10 years? I, I did oh, better than a half a year in jail, and I learned right away all there is to know about jail is that the most important thing in jail is to get out of jail. <laughs> At any cost, get the hell out of jail. And so we've had two or three things up there where a guy has been turned back out because his time came up and because he behaves well and then they turn him out and he goes out and rapes and kills somebody else. And the, the, the guards know it and the DAs know it. Everybody knows it. Let these kids out. They're not going to hurt anybody. They're, they never did hurt anybody. There, there's no place where I would be afraid to go head-to-head uh, -head with anybody about uh, the use of grass. It's good stuff. I know it's hard to swallow, but I'm telling you right here, it's good stuff. <laughs> We've had a number of different laws put in up there in Oregon, and each time they come back to put in more laws is because that more people are doing grass. So let's put more people in jail because more people are doing grass. And yet, nobody has ever gone up and seen what it's like in a penitentiary. If a penitentiary is going to be a detriment, if it's going to keep people out of jail, take people up and let them look at it. Let these kids who are being hostile and strange and with their long sleeves and bopping around and stuff, if they uh, do a little bit of graffiti and break one, take them up and let them spend a day in jail and have the guys that are in jail there talking to them. That will stop a lot of kids from doing stuff that they're not going to stop when they hear Officer Peabody come down and talk to their assembly and they're all laughing up their sleeves. Uh, you, you go up, anybody goes up and spends a day in jail, you learn a lot about jail. And the, you learn it real damn quick. And one of the things you learn is what people tell you. And they're, this stuff from Huntsville, Texas that Ted Koppel did, that's hell to go into a thing like that. On the death row there and this thing, the, the shots up the corridors, the, the sound that was coming out of there, the fact that these people are pinned up and the screams that are going on all the time, that's hell. And with every one of those, you're, you're breeding another one. You're, you're taking a kid that is kind of a half dumb and trying to do something that's going to make himself popular with his kids and you're poking him in jail and he's going to come out mean 
and bitter with asshole about that big, and he's going to be a bad man to have on the streets. Now, we know that. But nobody wants to stand up and say it from the, from the strict adult side of the community because we're still on the PTA, for instance. And you can't say this and be on the PTA board where we come from. So I leave Faye that part of, that's where her battle is being fought within the churches and on the PTA. And I have been fighting these other battles. I backed off of it for a good while. I've had this airplane circling our place steadily from May until late uh, August. That, that airplane comes and he circles, and I always know it doesn't have any marks on it, for one thing, and it's silver with black tips on the wings, and they circle down like that. He knows that I'm not growing grass. I'm, I'm, I, it'd be too easy to bust me if I were growing grass. That's not why he's there. He's there to intimidate me. And. One day there was people from, uh, it was Jenkins, the, one of the news people were there after I'd had the stroke. And I was talking about this airplane and the guy began to pick it up on the, the Nagra that he was doing his recording with. And he said, wait, we have to wait till the airplane goes over. I said, no, no, that's, this is what it's about. Let's go outside and get take the camera outside and all this big gear and take a picture of that airplane doing it. And so, well, it came back and it came back and dipped way down into the stair. And it's, this guy's trophy hunting. I would be a nice thing to have above his fireplace. Um, but I have now started trying to find out how much money is the government spending to rent that plane and that pilot and send that cop up there and fly around every day around my place. That would send a great number of people to college that amount of money, and we're letting them get away with it because the great bugaboo bad guy of drugs is all you have. It used to be communists. I went to the House on american Activities Committee meetings and, uh, when it was happening in uh, San Francisco, and they, I got my first taste of it there. The Daughters of the Revolution were sponsoring these meetings, and they wouldn't let anybody into the meetings except the B DAR. And we had to stand outside, and they motioned these people in. They had this little, they didn't want us in there. And I wasn't even anti-government at that time. I was, I was just along for the ride. And, but when I saw that they were having these people come up there, and they could get in 15 minutes late, and there's still places for them, they show their ticket, and they go in, you begin to get the feeling, this is fascism. This is fascism that is growing, and it's got its teeth sunk way into us, and I'm afraid that one of those teeth uh, comes from Arkansas. And I think no matter how good a guy you can be around women, that's not the same as being a good guy. When, you, when I first saw Clinton, I thought, hmm, he's nice, but he's got that buzz in his voice, you know. That, had a husky buzz as he saw how this is what it gets women. Get a husky right down there. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he lost my vote before that anyway, for one thing. Gotta look at the quality of women he's picking up. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, if somebody asked me what I thought about Clinton on one of these TV shows, I said, well, he's pretty good. He's pussy whipped as hell, but... <laughs> so we're coming up on the end of a century, at the end of a millennium. We've had more tornadoes since 1982 than in all the previous years. We've had each year, the tornadoes are doubling. We had a tornado in Portland, Oregon. Never seen a tornado in Oregon. This tornado came up pulled up fruit trees and threw them around. I don't know what this means, but I know that it, it's on our minds. When you look at the, the faces of people, these flood victims, you look at their faces. Are they bomb victims or any of these victims? There's something in their face that hadn't been there before. It's sanity. You see people helping each other, uh, lifting bags of sand to fix the levees. There's more to them that there's, they're not, not blaming anybody. 
They're not blaming. They're saying, let's work together and get this thing cleaned up. That sanity still runs through our veins. It's, you know, when you see that Jefferson building, when I go over and see the, the, the writing of Faulkner and the handwritten stuff of The Sound and the Fury, what it does is it makes you proud to be an American. And that also is one of the things that the establishment wishes I would quit saying. For one thing, I should have got a divorce, my kids should have been locked up, all the bad stuff, stuff should have happened to me, but it, it didn't. And I'm still saying I'm proud to be an American because the dream that these guys put together is a work of genius. Nothing else like it in history. These guys wrote this stuff to get in there and not only fix things that were uh, needed fixing, but put in loopholes so you can go back and refix stuff that, that uh, you don't even know about. This, the thing of uh, ban the bullet, uh, I tried selling this as a uh, bumper sticker. Nobody would put it on because it made the uh, NRA uh, mad at them. Nobody wants to go after the people with the guns because they're like you don't go up against a Doberman. And, and the Republicans, they believe that everybody should have uh, a Doberman. You know, at least a Doberman and a cyclone fence to go around your place and keep people from getting in on you. And most of the real strong Democrats that I know are, are planning to become Republicans just as quick as they win the lottery anyway. So, <laughs> so we, we're coming up on a, on a new century that gives, is gonna give us a, a new fresh start. And there's nothing else quite like it to be able to reach across to somebody you don't know, your eyes connect. I'll finish telling the story about Jed. Um, this is 10 years ago or so. They were going up, the, rest, the wrestling team was going to uh, Washington State to wrestle. And I'd wrestled on that team, and so did my brother, so did my brother's boy, my two sons. The Oregon wrestlers were wrestling people. It's, any wrestlers out there, wrestling parents, you know how you're dedicated to that sport. It's a, it's a poor sport, you have to make do. And they were traveling in a, uh, a van they'd borrowed from a chicken farm. And so they didn't have anything in it but seats and chicken stuff. And the van went off the cliff. And uh, we were called, we flew up to uh, Washington State and we stood there around. There was a Jed and this, his little black teammate, teammate, a guy named Lorenzo West, a really great, great wrestler with a lot of humor and a lot of fun guy. And there was a lot of other kids still bad hurt. But uh, Jed and Lorenzo, you go in there and look at them and you knew that, uh-oh, the fixed and dilated. And then doctors are telling you, uh, there's just no way that the brain has got too much bruising, it's going to swell. And so he convinced us, and I'm not sure I would be convinced anymore, to, to sign the thing that turns off the juice in time for them to salvage the organs. And that's hard. You know? and, and that's psychedelic. That's when you're right in there and you think, oh God, oh God, how can this be? It, it, I'll tell you women something. It affects men much more because women, by being women, they're already, they know the creation of life and they know the other side of life. When death comes to a man, it catches him by surprise, but, but uh, Faye and Sue and the West family, all the women, they were ready for it much more than we were. So we got in the plane and we flew uh, from Spokane and to Seattle. And the plane was, we landed there and we had to uh, get off and change planes. And uh, we stood there at the window and watched these two big boxes come down off the airplane, come down the ramp. And we were all standing there watching and there was nothing more to say. Uh, and finally, I didn't want to be there. I just turned around and left because I could see this is going to happen to everybody that I love. Everybody. 
like Kerouac says, born to die, born to die. And I, I wanted to cease to exist. I didn't want to commit suicide. I just wanted to find a button and say, that I can't take it. And I turned it off, and so I left. I was, and I didn't know where I was going, but I was leaving. And I was going up the concourse there, and here came a big black guy, probably about 35 or so, um, hair, long dreadlock hair, walking down this concourse, his face streaked with tears. And when he went by, he did something that changed my mind and changed my life. He made a gesture, and we all know the gesture. It's this. He did that. It mean, meant, you know, it didn't stop. He didn't look me in the eyes. He kept walking, and I kept walking. It meant more than if we'd held each other and hugged each other. He said, be strong. I, I, I know how you feel. And sometimes that's all you need is somebody saying, be strong. That's what this means. It's not this. It's not this. It's not this. It's this thing by your heart. Said, be strong. Um, and this was when I got thinking about warriors. This guy's a warrior. The people that I know and have known for a long, long time, they are warriors. And I'll do a little game on you guys here to show you how much you are warriors. I've done this little thing when we toured Poland and Czechoslovakia and all over America, and, and it's this. Uh, I'll give you one clue, and you guys answer it. The one clue is, we're talking about great warriors, one of the greatest warriors of our century. Here's the clue. She was the first lady. Say it. Now, how do we know that? Ted Koppel never said it. How do we know that Eleanor Roosevelt was a, was a lawyer? How do, how do we communicate this to these kids that don't know why she was a warrior. We're here because this is who we are. We're warriors because we know that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, fought great battles for us. We know her and we respect her, and, but we've never voiced it. They were having a big uh, convention uh, about the, the great inventions of this last century. There were people up there talking about the cyclotron, salt vaccine, and, uh, the uh, radar, and somebody at the back shouts out, it's the thermos! <laughs> and uh, they kind of ignore him, and they go on talking. Pretty soon he shouts out louder, it's the thermos! And they said, wait, come on up here. What do you mean it's the thermos? You're, uh, we're talking about a century when there's been more inventions than probably any of the other centuries. How can you say it's a thermos? He said, well, when you put hot water in the thermos, you notice it stays hot? I said, yeah. And when you put cold water in the thermos, it stays cold? I said, yeah. How do it know? <laughs> How do we know we're warriors? How do we know who we are? We do. We do. Go ahead and brighten up that little spark in your life. Brighten it up. And when you see each other across there, don't turn away from each other. Uh, when somebody needs money, when a guy on the street needs money, give him some damn money. We can afford it. Lay a couple bucks on him instead of, and then meet his eyes, deal with him. This is what most of them want, is just to have that, that human touch come out. And we don't have to have master's degrees or, or, or big houses. We can do it with the funny clothes on, so that we look at each other and say, have a nice day, and mean it and fucking mean it, right down from where you are, say, have a nice day. And the person looks back and their face lights up, and you already are having a better day. This is where it's gonna run from. Uh, I've got a good black friend, I've known him 30 years, he's a jazz player, he talks a lot of jazz stuff. And often we will get into this argument and people will come out and say, yeah, but look how many people are doing it, look how many voted for us, so forth. That has to do with numbers. We're never going to win by numbers. There are not enough of us. We are strong 
but there are not enough for us to win a huge popular election. We are losers, face it, from the beginning, and you don't have to deal with it later. We are dead-ass losers, and yet it's a wonderful game to be in there, to be able to uh, fighting for, for that uh, place on the block. And so my friend says, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. We're the seeds. <laughs>